Well, good morning once again, and welcome back. It's, it's uh, the course on fundamental principles in bioethics in the Masters of Bioethics at St. Thomas University. Beginning as always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine love. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. I always ask at the beginning if there are any questions or comments from uh, previous uh, lectures. And nothing so far, everything peachy keen and hunky-dory. That dates me a little bit to last century. <laughs> when that was popular. All right, so basically a little tiny review here. We, after doing a little very brief history of uh, natural science, the development of natural science mostly uh, in Europe uh, the past two centuries, the two big figures as far as evolution is concerned are Mendel and Darwin. And then going into this century, uh, sorry, going into, that was 1800s, in the 1900s, the first half of the 1900s, the big synthesis of the theory of evolution with the uh, theory of genetics or inheritance factors, right? Uh, that was the modern synthesis, which establishes basically the baseline for doing biology to this day studying nature and trying to glean as much information as possible from nature and uh, just analyzing the mechanisms of uh, living systems. Into then in the second half of the of last century was the big explosion of molecular biology in general. And so we now see that these inheritance factors are in fact genes, which are sequences of nucleotides in the DNA, which is the inheritance molecule, universal molecule of inheritance. Every organism that uh, we have studied so far on Earth uh, has DNA as its inheritance uh, molecule passed on to the next generation. And a very elegant system because essentially with this little package of this uh, super molecule with millions of atoms, right? Uh, the entire genome, the entire code for a species is passed on from one generation to the next at the molecular level. So you can see it's very elegant. That is enclosed in a double vault, if you will, functionally, thinking functionally, how this molecule of inheritance is then transmitted to the next generation. Consider this for a moment, the double vault of, uh, of um, transmitting this molecule to the next generation. The first layer of vault is what? The structure that holds the DNA hint within the cell, the nucleus, right? The nucleus. So that's the first vault, if you will. It's what's the purpose of the nucleus? To protect the DNA, double membrane, right? And then the next layer that vault is embedded in, an, in another vault, if you will, in another um, structure that is, hint, the basic unit of life, the basic unit of life in nature. The so. cell. The cell, the cell. All right, so you see, think about it. You know, the cell is the basic unit of life in nature. I'm talking about organic life right, as we experience it here on Earth, um, which is water-based, liquid water, right? So you see how that DNA is embedded in this double vault within the DNA for protection and that, that within the nucleus and the nucleus itself is within the cell. And so uh, you can say that functionally, the function of the cell essentially is to keep the nucleus alive and to keep the nucleus functional so that that nucleus can be transmitted to the next generation. And in fact, there are specialized cells that do that. What are the two specialized cells in sexual reproduction that uh, transmit that DNA to the next generation? 
the two specialized cells, gametes. sexual the gametes, the gametes, all right, uh, sperm and egg. Again, any animal, any plant that reproduces sexually, sperm and egg, right? Which is basically a nucleus with a, uh, with a cytoplasm to protect it. And so you see how elegant the thing is, right? All right. Uh, then we talked also about uh, the possibility of the origin of life on Earth. Again, organically, materially, uh, empirically, that can be measured from inorganic elements to organic molecules, right? And then those organic molecules by a series of complexification, uh, polymerization, etc., we can come up eventually with uh, the um, necessary subunits for having life on Earth, for having, and again, functionally, what is life? Whether we're talking about a single cell or we're talking about a whole organism, one word to describe life biochemically. Metabolism, <laughs> right? Metabolism, body function. So, so we talk about cellular metabolism and we talk about uh, metabolism of the whole body. That's what medicine studies, right? Okay, metabolism, body function. And so for that metabolism, we need a number of uh, molecules that are um, organic molecules, relatively complex, the four groups. But the main group, uh, the two main groups are going to be nucleic acid on one side for the, for the inheritance information. And then the workhorse of the cell, who does the work in a cell? What? Mitochondria. The? Mitochondria. Mitochondria, well, that's an organelle, but I'm still at the level of biochemistry. I'm still at the level of molecules here. Who, who does the work in metabolism? Who metabolizes in the cell? Hint, they speed up chemical reactions. For example, enzymes, what are enzymes? Proteins, proteins do the work, right? Thousands and thousands of proteins mm -hmm. that do the work. So I'm just trying to get you thinking here on a Saturday morning functionally about biology and what's going on right now with the breakfast that we had or didn't have early on. All right, so it comes down to organic molecules, comes down to proteins, which are encoded in the DNA, right? All right, and so the subunits of proteins are, another hand, there are 20 of them that occur naturally in amino. nature. Amino acids. It's amino acids. So Yuri Miller experiment, right? From a bunch of chemicals to amino acids. Bang, we can see how life could have started on Earth a long time ago in this little soup, all right, uh, in this uh, protobionts, this little tiny droplets uh, could have started from the starting materials that we find on Earth, on the crust of the Earth, as soon as it cooled down enough to have liquid water. Okay, then we bumped it up to the forces that, um, influence or oh, before the four forces that drive evolution, we looked at um, variation. We looked at variation. So we zoomed out from the cellular level. We've been talking in the first uh, three or four, three lectures, more or less, we've been talking pretty microscopically about biochemistry and um, cellular biology and the chemical reactions that we call metabolism for maintaining any organism alive, all right? And then last lecture, we zoomed out to the whole organism, to the organism as a whole, whether that organism is a bacterium or a protozoan, which is single cell, or a, a whale, which is the largest animal on earth, or any plant that you can think of, whatever organism we're talking about, uh, there are species of which there have been discovered about how many species have been classified uh, on Earth up until this point, approximately two million, right? Of an approximate estimated 10 to 20 million 
So we've only discovered about five to 10% of the species that are estimated to live on Earth. Where are the other 90% species that we haven't seen yet? Deep sea. Yeah, most likely they're microscopic and most likely they're at the bottom of the ocean, right? One to two miles down. So we've gotten a few robots down there, but very, very few in very limited space. And that's why most likely they haven't been discovered yet. Every now and then you do see a news article of a new monkey that was discovered in the jungles of uh, Borneo or Brazil or something like that, but that's rare, okay? It's becoming increasingly rare. Okay, so um, at the level of the organism, regardless of what size it is, what shape and what style, what species, we find within species, within species, what do we find? Variation, variation, all right? And that variation can occur at four different levels, all right? Four different levels, either structurally, which is called in a more sophisticated way, morphological or functional, which is physiological, right? Again, think what we're talking about is what's that meaning? When we talk about morphological variation, what is a morphological variation in the human species? Many, many, many. The shape of our whatever, face, <laughs> the size <laughs> that we have, okay? Morphological variation. We're all the same species because we have a different face doesn't mean that we're a different species, right? Some would like to think so, but they are respectfully wrong. All right, how about uh, uh, functional, physiological variation? Same species, variation. The variation can be subtle, like for example, how we each digest chocolate, <laughs> or it can be more drastic, how some people may be actually allergic to chocolate, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so functional variation, all the same species. Then, uh, two other levels that we talked about, moving from the physical to the psychological. Exactly, molecular on one side and behavioral on the other. We're all the same species, but we all act somewhat differently and some people act radically different <laughs> than others. <laughs> and that also happens in other species, in every species. What is a behavior in plants because People think that only animals have behavior because only animals move. But how about behavior in plants? How do plants behave or misbehave? Uh, phototropism. Yeah, phototropism, for example, where and where. If I'm talking about the shoot system, which is above ground, is the phototropism positive or negative? Positive. positive. And that same phototropism on the root system mm -hmm negative. So the roots actually hide away from light. They go away from light. And uh, another tropism that is well known and studied in plants, which is not photo, it reacts to another fundamental force. Geo. Geo, which is reacting to? The earth. Gravity, right? So the stimulus is gravity. The response is the tropism, which is a movement. It's a local movement because the plant is anchored. All right, so the roots then will have what kind of geotropism? Positive. The actual cells of the roots are being attracted positively toward gravity. They want to go to the center of the earth, okay? If they get there, they get burnt up, so they stay at the cross level. <laughs> and the roots will also have, um, uh, I don't know if the roots actually have a, a, a uh, Oh, the shoot system, yes. The shoot system will have a negative geotropism, right? But it may be latent. I'm not sure if it's an active geotropism, geotropism simply because the, the positive phototropism of the shoot system is so strong that it drives the plant upward, okay? All right, so you get the idea. We're just uh, greasing up the gears here. Uh, so variation, and why is variation important? for the theory of evolution because selection will 
act or may act on variation. All right? Selection may act on variation. Consider that phrase, selection acting on variation. But it's not an active acting, all right? It's not directed, it's not a conscious acting because there's no conscious in nature. We have to be very careful about that. There's no vitalism here, all right? It's passive by chance, but it offers the opportunity for selection because selection is going to be a selecting out process. All right, we'll get there. And selection is actually the fourth of the four uh, factors that drive or forces that drive evolution. The other three being the forces that drive evolution, mutation, migration, drift, and then selection, all right? So I covered mutation, migration, and drift the last lecture. Now I'm going to cover selection, all right? Now the basis, the basis is going to be which one of those uh, three? You think about, you think again functionally where they're occurring, where physically, all right, physiologically, mutation, migration, and drift. Uh, okay, let's go, uh, let's go look at drift first. Drift, is drift directional or, um, or is it by chance? It's directional. By chance. And the directional. Drift is by chance. It happens that this tree that hit by lightning at this storm, if the storm had not gone through that local region, that tree may not have gotten, get hit by that lightning, all right? So uh, drift is a chance event. Mm -hmm. It's actually, we can see a combination between determinism and chance. Uh, which chance, you know, falls into probability, right? Or, uh, or process. What I say by determinism is this. Let's think of zebras that, uh, and let's think of two populations of zebra. They're the same species, right? These two populations are the same species because by definition, the population is of the same species. But these are two populations in the savanna of, uh, of Africa in the savanna plains of grass in, um, in Africa, and they are adjacent populations. In other words, they're grazing on two plains, on two patches of savanna grass in, uh, in Africa, and these two patches of grass are adjacent to each other. So there's a population A and a population B of zebras, they can have several dozen zebras. They can perhaps have a hundred zebras, all right? Uh, naturally, would we expect some migration back and forth between these two uh, populations? Yes, okay. That migration back and forth, what is that called? If we consider the zebra to be essentially a bag of genes of the zebra genome. So the zebra skin <laughs> is a bag holding the zebra genome functionally in the DNA in the zebra cells, specifically in the gametes of that zebra, whether if it's a female zebra in the ovaries, in the eggs in her ovary, if it's a male zebra in the sperm in his uh, testes, all right? So these bags of DNA are flowing back and forth because the individual zebras are moving <coughs> one from pod A to pod B or population A to population B back and forth. Each zebra will have, well, we see all zebras doing the same migration in an orderly fashion though they all line up a, 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 and on a count of three, they migrate against each other back and forth. That's very unlikely behavior, right? It's gonna be more kind of a random behavior. If they're grazing, they may drift into the other population, okay? Uh, if it's the alpha male, he may be looking for females in one population or the other, or if it's a beta male, the beta male has been excluded out from the harem by the alpha male. So this beta male may 
give it a try at the other population, which may have a weaker alpha male, and this beta male in population A may become the alpha male in population B if that beta male manages to displace the weaker alpha male. You see, so the competition is on. So there's drift going on. There is flow uh, uh, um, going on also, gene flow, all right? But at the molecular level, at the molecular level, what do we have on the DNA that is happening? And there's a background on average, you know, uh, one in every 10,000 um, DNA uh, molecules per generation mutation, mutation at the molecular level, right? Chance mutation by mutagens. And so that is the basis, that is the beginning. So consider how slow this process is. A mutation needs to happen by chance to generate the possibility of a variation in any one of the four levels of a variation that can occur morphologically, functionally, you know, physiologically, behaviorally, or again, molecular. And to allow for the possibility then for selection itself to act on that variation. Okay. So it's really a very slow and kind of unlikely process to happen. The chances are that that mutation in itself will either be neutral or uh, a positive, it could be a positive mutation, rarely, very rarely, there are positive mutations, or it could be a negative mutation, if a de deleterious mutation, if it changes the frame shift, for example, of the DNA sequence, which will then make for nonsense instead of the proper protein. But considering that, what percentage, so of the, of the genome of any species, right, um, at least the human, which is the one that we studied so much, how much of the genome, actually, of our genome, actually codes for protein, has coding regions? What percentage? Remember, I've mentioned that along the way also. It's a very small percentage of the human genome actually codes for proteins. In other words, it has genes in it. It's a coding region. It's only about 3%. And that came out in the 90s with the Human Genome Project. All right, it was a very humbling thing to uh, learn that our human genome of the 3 billion base pairs, only about 3% of that actually codes for proteins, okay? The rest, the other 97% has been labeled as junk DNA, in quotations, junk DNA, because it doesn't have any coding region. It doesn't code for any protein, all right? It's nonsense, we, we call that a nonsense code. However, that junk DNA may have another function. At any rate, we carry that DNA and it's baggage that is passed on. Yes, in every egg and in every sperm, there is 97% junk DNA that is passed on to the next generation. <laughs> we inherited that from our parents and those who are procreating in our generation are, are, are passing it on to their children. <laughs> Okay, uh, so that junk DNA may have another function that is not a coding function, that is not a protein function. It may have a function at the conformation, at the level of the conformation of the DNA itself, the higher level structure, what we call the higher level structure. That's what I studied, actually, that was my dissertation at uh, Purdue, the relationship with, between the function and the structure of DNA. Because remember that most of the DNA has to be shut down most of the time, right? Otherwise, since we have the full genome in every single species, and if that genome started expressing in every single species, it would be absolute chaos, right? Because liver cells will start doing brain functions and brain cells will start doing stomach functions and everything else. So it'd be absolute chaos, not viable. So most of the DNA is shut down most of the time in most of our cells. What is shutting down that DNA? Essentially the compaction, 
the 10,000 fold compaction, right? So there are only little tiny regions of the DNA are open at any particular time. And that region uh, correlates to the particular cell type or the cell, the tissue that is uh, functioning at the time. So again, so the liver, uh, the liver tissue, the liver cells are expressing liver genes, are expressing liver proteins, and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. So maybe at the higher level structure, the higher structure uh, of the three dimensional folding of the DNA, maybe that junk DNA has a function there. All right. So DNA may have more functions than just coding region, just inheritance uh, as such. It may have a metabolic function. Question. Yeah. So, um, what happens when um, those cells, like I guess it's a mutation, but they start to grow parts in parts like an ear, let's say on the forehead? What goes wrong that that occurs? Like that's possible. Yes. You know. Like excellent, excellent, very good. Okay, so uh, we got you people thinking. An ear on the forehead. All right. So. You think about it, um, that is at the level of an actual organ, okay? It's not even at the level of tissue, it's not even at the level of individual cells. So when that happens, typically um, that has to do with developmental genes early on in the embryonic level, all right? And remember how I talked about Hox genes briefly? the homeotic box, right? The homeotic box is the one that determines uh, the structure, excuse me, the, the actual structure, the basic body plan of every embryo. And these Hox genes occur, they're highly conserved, they uh, occur throughout the animal kingdom, uh, whether it's a fly or a human, right? Where the head goes and where the tail goes and so forth. So the basic body plan, basic body plan, is determined by developmental genes early on. So these genes have to express early on. I'm talking about the early stages of embryonic development, the first few days, the first few weeks, and they have to express in concert. In other words, gene A first, and then gene B, and then gene C in that sequence, all right, uh, so that the body parts will end up where they're supposed to be. And experiments have been done, mostly in flies, where those developmental genes have been switched around. And you actually get flies uh, a few weeks later or a few days later when those flies actually hatch. They'll get legs coming out of their heads and wings coming out of their abdomen. You know, you get weird flies uh, simply because the Hox genes were uh, discombobulated from their original sequence. Those generally, they're called developmental genes and they express early on in embryonic development. Typically, if there's anything that goes wrong with those developmental genes, what will happen with that embryo? That embryo will eventually become non-functional, will become non-viable. Depending on what the abnormality is, you know, the abnormality could be missing a finger or missing a hand or missing a whole arm. Well, that's compatible with life. People without arms and legs can still live. But if the developmental genes uh, are more crucial, depending on what developmental gene messes up, you know, if the head ends up inside the stomach or something like that, you know, the brain ends up down in the abdominal region, that's non-viable that embryo or fetus sooner or later is gonna die in the embryonic development. And that is called either a spontaneous abortion or a miscarriage, you see? And so there are checkpoints, there are checkpoints along the embryonic development that say basically check, is this embryo still viable or not? And there are natural processes then when the embryo has too many gross abnormalities that embryo will naturally be discarded. That's the, when it occurs very early on in the first couple of months, it's a spontaneous abortion. After in the fetal stage, it's called a miscarriage, but functionally it's the same thing. It's nature getting rid of gross abnormalities that are not compatible with life, they're non-viable. 
Okay, so in other words, body parts that are coming out in the wrong place, or it could be the front, it could be structures, or it could be functions, malfunctions. Okay, uh, if they're not viable, they'll be discarded early on. If they're viable, then that person has some abnormality. That animal, that plant will have some abnormality. You know, and but then, are these sorry? Um, but are these caused by like something external, like something that the parents did, or how do they? Okay. What so, makes those genes function improperly? Exactly. It's a very broad question. The, really, the bottom line answer is it depends. Very, very broad. It could be external or it could be internal. It could be a mutation in the ovum, or it could be a mutation in the sperm in one specific chromosome or the egg or the sperm, you know, like thalassemia or typically the Mendelian genetics, the Mendelian abnormalities. A hemophilia, for example, it can be on the mother's side or the father's side, down to the molecular level of the genes. So we, can, we consider that something internal from the actual genome misexpressed, uh, uh, or it could be external of a mutagen or a carcinogen. For example, uh, the mom who was pregnant went for an x-ray and they did not cover her abdomen with the lead shield so, uh, so that she got radiation on the, maybe she was pregnant early on, didn't know she was pregnant the first couple of weeks, but that external mutagen, the, the radiation caused uh, uh, an abnormality, you see? So it really, it depends. The, the stimulus could be internal, external, or a combination of factors. It could be something that's internally latent and gets activated by an external uh, stimulus, like a chemical, for example, a, it's called a teratogen or a, uh, a um, carcinogen, like, for example, nicotine or something like that, or alcohol for, uh, again, pregnant women. Hello? So the stimulus can come from a large variety of sources, and that's why genetics is so exciting, from the molecular genetics all the way up to population genetics, right? Because that's really, if you want, where the action is occurring. But it's not very visible at first because the genetic is hidden, right? It's hidden within the cell, it's hidden within the nucleus of the cell, but it's the expression of the genetics, all right? So a lot, a lot of studies and work is being done in genetics today, all the way from molecular genetics to population genetics, right? So you guys are getting the picture that uh, the more we delve into the issue, the more complicated it looks. Mm -hmm. And it is because uh, life is complicated. <laughs> and yet it's doable, right? <laughs> we'll take it one issue at a time. Okay, so yeah, good review, good discussion. You see, this is all prompting us for uh, today's lecture, which is excuse me, on uh, selection, which is that fourth force, but it's really the one that actually makes uh, uh, evolution happen, all right? Makes for the possibility of evolution. Anything else, other comments or questions? Okay, let's go forward then. Three types of selection, artificial, natural, and sexual selection. They are distinct from each other. Uh, the artificial selection is the one that we do and have been doing not for centuries, but for millennia. All right, whether consciously or not, just trying to hide this in a little bit. <laughs> okay. So here's just a, a, a one panel example of artificial selection. For example, it's used a lot in agriculture. Uh, this is a wild crab apple from whence the apple has come in nature, okay? And they're tiny. These wild crab apples are not only the size of a small cherry, for example, but they also tend to be bitter, <laughs> okay? And over centuries, uh, um, farmers have been selecting on the crab apple to make it a commercial apple. And the two big advantages, the two things that they, the two characteristics that they have been selecting on the two variations, the two variants. I mentioned that the crab apple, which is a naturally occurring apple, all right, is both small and bitter. 
And so we want to select on what two characteristics, size and flavor, okay? So by eating a bunch of crab apples from a tree, we find that first, uh, the most, the easiest of those two characteristics, the easiest to pick is what? Without having to bite into it yet. The big size or flavor? Uh, the size. Okay, so let's see. We're in front of a crab apple bush, and of the train uh, fruits that are there, one is definitely larger, a little larger than the other nine. So what do we do? We pick that one. Okay, and then uh, we bite into it, and it turns out it's bitter, but it's bigger. So <laughs> we're going to take those seeds and plant that one. And so on average those seeds are going to give crab apples that are about the same size, which is a larger size from the previous, right? From the parent generation. By the way, the parent is denoted as a capital P, the parental generation, and then the offspring are F, capital F, and so the first generation are F1. So for example, we are the F1 of our parents. Our parents are capital P, and we are the F1 of our parents. When you people have children, uh, your children will be the F1 of you when you become P, but they will be the F2 of your parents, <laughs> okay? And so on, so we can follow filial, the F stands for filial, filial generations, F1, F2, F3. So <clears throat> again, on the crab apple, <clears throat> the parental tree is gonna be P. Now, the, uh, we chose the largest, crab apple there, right, of the 10 that we saw, we planted those seeds, and that's F1. F1, when it bears fruit, all of those crab apples, on average, are going to be about the same size as the largest one from the P generation. You follow me? A little intellectual <laughs> exercise here, but uh, you get the drift. Let's say that from the F1 generation, we get uh, five crab apples, we get five fruits, but they're all a little larger than the pea, right? And there's one that is larger. Of those five, there is also one that is larger. See, we're selecting on size, on larger size, and we keep selecting on that larger size until we get to the size of a big apple, all right? It may have taken n generations. We don't know how many generations it took. It may have taken five, 10, 15 generations to get to, now we have a crab apple tree that is producing all large apples, okay? But they're all bitter. So now we're going to concentrate on the bitterness of all the crab apples from the, let's say the fifth generation, right? Or the 15th generation that we got them to be this size. Now we're down to F15. Now that's gonna become P or flavor. So they're all bitter, but it turns out one of them is less bitter. And there's a little remnant of some sweetness there. So we're going to take those seeds and plant those. They're all going to be big on average, right? Mm -hmm. And again, we're going to get hopefully a variation on flavor, whereby uh, some may be more bitter, but some may be a little less bitter. So now we keep selecting on the less bitter until that less bitter actually becomes sweet. <laughs> or the bitterness is so small and the sweetness, the glucose is so large that we no longer feel the bitterness because it's overwhelmed by the, by the sweetness on the taste, right? There still may be some bitter there, but it's, over, it's like uh, you know any bland food, food is bland and then we put salt on it. Well, the salt overwhelms any other flavor that may have been there, okay? You get my drift. The drift is selecting on a variant. That is the variant that we want, whatever variant it is. It could be size, it could be flavor. Uh, let's look at another example, still with farming. We today have cauliflower, we have broccoli, we have cabbage, we have kale, and then something called kohlrabi. All right, all of these five different um, variants come from different parts of the wild mustard, which is a little weed like this, 
This is the flower of the wild mustard. It's a little weed, okay? And wild mustard is a little weed. And different parts of the wild mustard become either cauliflower or broccoli or cabbage or kale or kohlrabi, which I've never tasted kohlrabi. <laughs> but here it tells you which part of the plant has been selected and enhanced. For example, the flower <laughs> of the wild mustard, which in nature is a little tiny thing, can barely be seen. The, the, if we select on that flower, we can get a cauliflower over many, many generations, choosing the biggest one, the most bulky one, and so forth. Similar, uh, to get the broccoli, what happens here is the flower development is suppressed, <laughs> okay, and so on and so forth. You can get all these different uh, veggies from wild mustard by artificial selection. It's not restricted to plants by any stretch of the imagination. It can be done in animals. When it's done in the farming industry, it's called animal husbandry, animal husbandry, all right? Selecting for particular characteristics. The horse that used to be the size of a large dog, all right? And many of these animals, they're mostly selected for size, but also plumpness to be more plump like uh, the turkey, which the wild turkey looks more uh, rachitic, more small uh, and skinny. And we select on the wild turkey, especially the thighs that, and the drumsticks to become huge and the breasts uh, muscles, all right? Uh, so that we get these um, um, selected turkeys, domestic, domesticated turkeys, and there are turkey cages that I've seen actually in Maya ruins in Central America, made out of adobe. Uh, and so they already domesticated the turkey down in Mesoamerica centuries ago. The same with the chicken. A wild chicken basically looks like the size of a, uh, of a, uh, maybe not as small as a, as a, uh, forgetting my birds. Um, oh my goodness, a blue jay or something like that, <laughs> okay, much smaller. That's a wild chicken. We selected on the chicken for uh, the larger uh, thighs and the larger breast uh, uh, muscles and so forth. And we come up with the chickens that are today also fed by hormones, which makes them retain water, which makes them grow up even larger and so on and so forth with uh, many domesticated animals of which their wild uh, counterparts are much smaller, okay? Uh, we can also select for no, no feathers <laughs> on a chicken. And uh, I think it was the Israelis that came up with a featherless chicken because it's labor intensive to pluck the feathers from the chicken and labor means money for the industry, means expense, uh, means uh, payroll, etc. So I think it was the Israelis that invented the featherless chicken. They simply plucked out the feather genes on an embryo early on, and that embryo developed uh, featherless, and then they upscaled that <laughs> into a whole mass production. And there's one downside of these featherless chickens, at least one downside, of course, they get cold very easily, so they have to be maintained warm all the time because they don't retain their heat any longer. Uh, even though they are warm-blooded by being a bird. But they also, even as important than that, uh, perhaps even more important, is that they have to be maintained indoors all the time and in the shade, otherwise they fry up with the UV from, uh, from the sunlight, okay? And they would actually literally cook uh, alive if they go out in the sunshine. And so uh, other control conditions, they can be maintained, but I guess it's cost effective to do this to chickens when they are slated to be uh, sold for food. Okay. Um, Question. Yep. Um, so about this uh, control that we have over the animals, like I'm talking about faith-wise, is it ethical to be to do this or um is there is it too much like abusing the okay. power that we have when is when is it too much right 
I think that we would normally, uh, we have to follow certain intuitions here, all right? But normally we would draw a basic line between plants and animals. Well, we normally do two plants, we might not do two animals. Uh, for example, one also another way of um, doing um, artificial selection in plants. So we've gone from a, a gross method of just doing selecting on the larger size to actually intervening in the genome. All right, and we know that if we double the genome of apples, for example, this happens in many plants. If we double the genome so that it's 4N instead of being 2N, you know that diploid is 2N, right? Uh, if we make that genome of 4N, that fruit will just become larger, will become double the size, but it has no other effect on the plant that we can tell. The flavor stays the same, the plant grows, it's certainly viable. If we duplicate the whole genome, not individual genes, mind you, all right, if we alter the ratio of individual genes or individual chromosomes, uh, that's gonna cause an abnormality on the plant. But if we double the entire genome, all right, let's say I have no idea what the uh, apple genome is, but let's say that it's uh, 15, 15 uh, pairs of chromosomes. If we double it to 30 pairs of chromosomes, all right, for, to make it 4N instead of 2N, that fruit just becomes twice as large automatically, but it has no other effect that we can tell on its metabolism, on its physiology. So that's now we're doing genetic engineering on, on plants, all right? And so in general, we can justify it for feeding more people better at a cheaper price. And it doesn't hurt the plant anyway, or the plant is gonna get eaten, the plant's gonna die by when, when we eat it, right? And we have no compunction about eating plants, we gotta eat something, <laughs> all right? So even vegetarians have no compunction about biting right into an apple and killing that apple or killing the tomato that they're eating. How about animals? Where do we draw the line? Again, what, two main fields where animals are useful for humans one is it obviously in feeding, right, <clears throat> in the population. What's the other field where animals are useful to humans to the point of killing the animal? Experimentation. Experimentation. Like medical, medical experimentation research for, for R&D, research and development of uh, medications, right? Which again is justified, but there are protocols to be followed. So for example, a new medication, this vaccine, the COVID vaccine, for example, before it's tested on animals, it's gonna be tested on bacteria, <laughs> just to amplify the DNA, for example. So we start with the lowest organism first. We experiment on bacteria first. If it's successful there, then we bump it up. Then we may experiment on some plant like uh, Arabidosis, which is a weed that has been, uh, it was uh, one of the first plant genomes that was uh, deciphered. Uh, if it works on the plant, then we bump it up, then we experiment on maybe the fruit fly, which can give us uh, uh, thousands of new flies, the F1 generation within a few days, okay? And if it works on the fly, then we bump it up. Eventually, we have to end up into what is called a model, a mammalian system or a mammalian model. So in the mammalian model, who, which is the animal that's gonna get it in the lab? Rabbits. The rabbit, mus musculus right? The rabbit typically is going to get it because we grow rabbits in the lab galore, all right? And every few days, the mom will drop a new litter and uh, typically five, six, eight, ten rabbits. And so in a week, you have a new generation of rabbits and so forth. There are protocols. They're very strict protocols. By the way, rabbits are also used uh, in the lab quite a bit because uh, they're mammals. And so functionally, they have similar metabolism to us. But there are strict protocols. I remember when I was at Purdue uh, doing the genetics uh, doctorate. And first of all, Purdue is a huge university. It's called the MIT of the Midwest. It's a, bi it's a technological university, okay? It's a polytech. Uh, many astronauts have come from Purdue. It's number one in, in engineering, uh, faculty in engineering uh, schools, uh, including genetic engineering, right? And so a lot of biology is going on there. Also animal husbandry, they have a vet school because it's the Midwest. Uh, you look, it's all very, very flat. So you look to, 
to the east and all you see is corn and then you look to the west and all you see is soybean to the horizon, it's very, very flat. Uh, but it's, it's a power horse, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a power machine of uh, technology at Purdue. And there are several buildings, several buildings of several stories high uh, in biology, just biology. Uh, the math building, for example, has its 10 story building, okay, full of uh, offices, uh, just a math uh, department. But biology, the one that I was studying in, uh, is in the, it was the Lilly building from Eli Lilly. You've heard of Lilly, Lilly Pharmaceuticals, right? Eli Lilly uh, was from uh, Indiana and he donated a few million dollars to build the, uh, the Lilly building of biology. And it's an L shape. So that if you look at it from a helicopter or a drone, you see an L shape for Lilly, <laughs> for L, for Lilly. Anyway, the building uh, above ground, the shoot of the building, uh, was uh, four stories and uh, the root of the building below ground was five stories, <laughs> five stories below ground, okay? And the lowest, the lowest level, uh, it was a huge building. It had dozens and dozens of lab in each floor. And the lowest level, right, uh, was all those labs, that's where the electron microscopes were because that's where it shakes the least down there. <laughs> on the ground and the electron microscopes are extremely sensitive to movement. So that's where all the lab, all the electron microscopes were down in the first level of the, um, the lowest level on the ground. Anyway, remember the Midwest, you know, is one huge plane, right? The Great Plains, but it's high. The fact that it's flat doesn't mean that it's sea level. It's high above sea level. For example, Denver, right? The city of Denver in Colorado has, and Denver is part, that's where the Great Plains begin or end, depending on which way you're going, if you're going east or west, but the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so Denver is at the base of the Rocky Mountain range, right? And then Denver has a very famous stadium. So I don't like football, but there has a very famous uh, stadium, uh, football stadium. Anybody know the name of the Denver football stadium? Mile high stadium. Exactly, mile high. That means that it is a mile high. So it's 5,000 feet above sea level. And the Great Plain of the United States, about 5,000 feet above sea level. All that is sediment, right? Sediment from the Mississippi Sea that used to be, now it's a river, the Mississippi River, but there used to be a whole sea when we had tropicalization of the earth, when the uh, the uh, surface of the ocean was about one or two miles above us, <laughs> right? And so the earth was uh, covered with a lot of water, ocean, and the Great Plain was the bottom of the Mississippi Sea. And so there's a lot of sediment there, miles, uh, about a mile of sediment, more or less. Anyway, so there's a lot they can dig on the ground and build on the ground a lot. They also have at Purdue, by the way, they have underground corridors. So one can go from one building to another. When you have four or five feet of snow above the ground in the, in the middle of the winter, uh, no problem because they can get on the ground with uh, heated uh, corridors so that students don't have an excuse for missing class. There's no break for uh, snow storms. Uh, what got me into that? Oh, genetic engineering, oh, when do we stop? So when is it ethical? Yes, the protocols on the mice. The mice were about five, about three levels down on the, one, of the, one of the labs underneath, uh, several labs actually, they, they raised the mice. They were just, uh, they produced mice down there, okay? For many different labs. They did the transgenics, mice that were altered genetically to have certain characteristics, okay? There were nude mice, for example, that um, didn't have any hair on them. Uh, so they looked like this, pinkish, uh, fetal looking, uh, but they were nude, not because they didn't have any hair, but because they did not have an immune system. Their immune system was shut down. And so those nude mice were done, were used for uh, chemical research, for uh, pharmaceutical research to see how they reacted to certain uh, 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 substances and so forth. Very, very strict protocols to raise the mice, to maintain the mice, 
to kill a mouse, when you had to euthanize a mouse, you had to do it humanely, basically decapitation, which is the fastest way and so forth. And it had to be justified. If you could do the same experiment in a fly, you would have to do the same experiment in a fly first before you went to the mouse, okay? Uh, remember one particular protocol, when the mom drops her litter, uh, right away, the, typically they were uh, students, they were uh, RAs or TAs, uh, teaching assistants or uh, research assistants, the students, the graduate students would have to go in and whatever time it was that the mom dropped that litter, they have to take out the dad because the dad proceeds to eat the young. <laughs> They'll start eating their young, okay, uh, unfortunately. And so that uh, father has to be taken out right away. It could be Sunday at three o'clock in the morning. So the graduate student who is in charge of that part of, of mice has to be tracking that mouse. And every few hours they have to go and check, has she dropped a litter yet? Has she given birth to the babies yet? You know, that's how strict the protocol is. If they didn't do that and the father proceeded to eat or start just to eat a mouse, a baby mouse, that an inspector would come by, would shut down that lab and they can shut down the whole building for not following the protocol. They would be in violation. So very, very strict protocols on the humane treatment of animals in the lab, okay? Even so, there is a general movement now to try to get away from experimenting, especially on mammals, certainly on primates, which is the very, very last resort, okay? And typically on the primates, it was the rhesus monkey that would get it. Uh, uh, sometimes in very extreme cases, they may have to experiment on a chimpanzee, which is the closest to us in genome. That happened many, many years ago, decades ago, when, the, uh, when they were doing exploration of the, the sky and the um, orbit. So I think a chimpanzee was sent into orbit before a human was sent into orbit. And I think he came back alive. Uh, so you see the very, very strict protocols. At the end of the day, if we have to try a drug, a medication that is very, very specific, and for example, the COVID vaccine, before we test it on humans, and now it's on clinical trials, right? Clinical trials meaning human trials. But before, just before we go into the clinical trial, we're gonna to have to test on an animal to see if it passes protocol or not. <clears throat> because if it doesn't pass protocol at an animal, we have to stop go back to the drawing board and tweak it so that it will pass the protocol on the animal before we test on the human because of the value of the human, okay? So at the end of the day, at the very end of the day, it's all about is it of sufficient benefit to the human population or not, okay? Is it sufficient benefit to the human population? Of course, animals cannot consent. And so that's why it behooves us and that's where bioethics come in very strongly. And then there are these IRBs, institutional review boards. Every university should have, uh, must have an institutional review board that reviews the protocols of the experiment of the research experiment of the proposal that is gonna be used. Even when the proposal is non-lethal or non-harmful. For example, if we run a questionnaire on the student population, we professors, I may have some research. Did you like uh, the food in the cafeteria today? You know, and I do a research, I do a questionnaire to the student population. I need permission from the institutional reboard, review board. I need permission from, my protocol needs to be approved. Uh, to see if there's any harm to the students and if the harm, if there is some harm, if the harm is justified for the benefit of finding, for example, the vaccine to uh, the antidote to the COVID pandemic. So you follow? It's all protocols, but we certainly have always the best interests of these animals. We're not going to be killing them for pleasure uh, because that is uh, not only unethical, it's also illegal, all right? So you see where it goes. It's all about protocols. It's all about being part of the institutional review boards. That's where 
uh, you people could land a position. Uh, the, the downside with bioethics is that these institutions, they want the advice for free. So they want us to volunteer into the IRB, okay, whether it's a hospital or a university. And so the trick is to get paid for it <laughs> because you're paying for the degree and it's only fair, it's ethical that you get paid for the knowledge once you get the degree, you know. But uh, usually institutions, they want it, they want the advice for free, okay. So you see where it goes? Uh, the, it's all about the protocol and it's all about justifying ethically what we're doing with these animals. If this gets, uh, if the chicken, you know, the chicken is going to be killed anyway. Now, another argument would be, should we just go vegan altogether? I don't know, what's your sense? Should we stop eating animals? How many say no. yes? How many no? Some may no. still be thinking about it. Well, I'll tell you where I stand. All right, I'm not going to stop eating animals uh, uh, because I go by the uh, teeth. Uh, we have, we are heterodonts. Don't is a reference to the teeth, to the tooth. All right, diente, don't. And hetero means that we have several shapes of teeth, meaning that the different shapes of teeth are involved in different functions. Uh, fish, for example, are homodonts. They only have little cone teeth, right? But uh, we're heterodonts, meaning that we have molars, we have uh, uh, incisors, we have canines. These different shapes of teeth have different function. The molars are for grinding. For grinding what? Uh, seeds and fruits and vegetables. For grinding to get, uh, to get the, the, the cellulose broken up as much as possible, okay? But we also have canines. Canines are for tearing. For tearing into what? For tearing into meat, for tearing into muscle, which is on the animal kingdom. And the incisors, the incisors are also clippers either for plants or animals. So basically what I'm trying to say is that the shape of our teeth tells us that we should eat a variety of plants and animals. That we should, that it's part of our diet is to eat a variety of plants and animals. Yes, I know that we can get uh, uh, proteins from legumes, for example. So technically, we could possibly be vegans and not need animal protein in our diet. Uh, there's an issue with animal fat that we need some cholesterol in our body. There's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol, you know, as part of the diet. Uh, but there are uh, vegetable oils and so forth. At any rate, um, I'm going to stay heterodont as long as the uh, animal is killed humanely, all right? But I do believe in animal husbandry. I believe that it has a function and a purpose. It also keeps the price of food a little lower uh, so that there's enough food for feeding people and so forth. What do you think? What do you feel about uh, the issue? If we weren't made conscious of the fact that animals suffer, why, when we eat them, we would be eating meat anyways. Yes, if we, if we do well. So suffering, at least they could feel pain, right? Uh, so yeah. We also make a distinction between pain and suffering. Uh, we'll look at that in the end of life issue course uh, next semester, but uh, Mm, they feel pain for sure, whether they suffer, I don't know, because if suffering, if the seed of suffering is the conscience, uh, the human soul, you know, for example, when we see uh, another human being being run over by a car, that is absolutely distressful, you know, and we suffer seeing that, and the car did not hit me, but it would bring me to tears and to run to that person, to that victim, see if I can help. Uh, an animal gets run over, the other animals around, they probably flee from the scene. Uh, did they suffer from their uh, mate getting run over by a car? You know, did the lizard, did the second iguana suffer from the surf, first iguana being hit by the car? Probably not, <laughs> right? Um, some primates have shown, yes, uh, monkeys have shown some grief 
uh, apparently how we can to interpret because we have to interpret we cannot get into the brain of the chimpanzee right but the chimpanzees do seem to show grief when their peers are killed and there is an anecdote that um, aborigines uh, normally don't hunt uh, monkeys because the peers of the monkeys go into grief when the, a monkey is uh, arrowed or something like that. Uh, so there's an anecdote there. But anyway, uh, normal people, I think, don't really eat monkey, you know? That's why we should stay away also from uh, game, from eating game, which has a lot of value in the black market. That's part of this problem here uh, is eating this wildlife, eating bats. <laughs> Okay, eating anything that moves is not a good idea uh, for many reasons. Some are ethical and some are actually health <laughs> reasons. These animals could be vectors, they could be carriers of stuff that can affect us. So that gets into issue of game, eating game. But at the end of the day, I think it's gonna be up to each individual conscience as long as the animal is killed in a humane way. I understand that cattle, for example, they are uh, electrocuted to death, which is a very fast thing, it's a part, or they're actually shot on the forehead uh, with a, a stunt that kills them. Uh, it's important that the, if that's the way it's gonna be done, that the stimulus is uh, strong enough so it doesn't leave the animal maimed but not killed, right? things like that. But again, there are protocols in the slaughterhouses, there are protocols that have to be followed very, very strictly to protect the, uh, the well-being of these animals, you know, until they're slaughtered. But the slaughtering itself has to follow protocols, strict protocols, laws that have been enacted to, uh, it's a humane treatment of animals. Folks, much more can be said there. It does go into the bioethical thing but uh, I don't want to get derailed too much. You can see that I'm easily derailed. Uh, my whole point here is that we have been doing artificial selection for centuries, for millennia, actually. The dog uh, is uh, supposed to have been um, domesticated either by the Mesopotamians or the Egyptians uh, centuries, maybe millennia ago, maybe the Chinese, I don't know, but ancient dynasties, okay? The big difference with artificial selection is that the human will is engaged. And that was my whole point about this slide, is that we're selecting uh, uh, consciously, we're selecting voluntarily, voluciously, on particular traits, on particular variants. Very different from natural selection. Because natural selection, essentially, it does the same thing, but at random, at random. It's, there's not a, conscience of the mind, there's not a nature mind that is selecting, you know, a super mind that is selecting consciously on variance. No, it happens passively, but it does happen, okay? And so we see it, like Meyer says, post facto. We see it after the fact. We see the evidence of evolution, but we don't see the evolutionary process while it's happening itself, because we never know in anticipation what variant, what animal, what plant, what bacterium is gonna get selected out, okay? We only see the net result, essentially the ones that did not get selected out, in other words, the ones that are still living around us and among us. All right, now, Darwin saw uh, five observations. Darwin made five observations, and from these five observations, he inferred five conclusions, all right? The first observation, they're not necessarily in sequence, but uh, he um, managed to observe these five things uh, where he went in the Vigo boy voyage and other places that he went uh, around. He noticed that there was an overabundance, an overabundance of gametes and an overabundance of zygotes, of uh, embryos, okay? First, an overabundance of gametes. For example, I use the example of fish, which is easily understood. Fish lay out many, many eggs. And fish are reproducing sexually, so they're 
they're ova and they're sperm. So we got a female fish, we got a male fish. How many baby fish does it take to replace the parent fish? The one female and the one male, the one father and the one mother. How many baby fish does it take to replace them? Two. Two, you know, one boy and one girl, <laughs> okay? And yet we see fish laying out thousands of eggs and millions of sperm. So there's definitely an overabundance of gametes, even in the human itself, okay? And so, and uh, the vast majority of those gametes don't really fertilize. And the ones that do fertilize, the vast majority of zygotes don't survive. I'll give you now, uh, as we go forward, examples of each. So I'm not, I'm not gonna dwell on it at this point, I'm just gonna list them, and then I have a slide for an example of each one of these, okay? Another observation was that uh, populations in nature remain stable, more or less stable over time. So if we go to the African savanna today and we see that population of zebras and there are 200 zebra in that population. And then we go next month and we see that population of zebra and we see about, well, we see 199 zebra. And then we go a year from now and that population of zebra has 201 zebra. It remains more or less stable, all right? So populations in nature on average are more or less stable. It means that there is some kind of replacement level. The number of births equals the number of deaths on average, seasonally, all right? And so it also means that because there are more offspring that actually survive, the, there are more youth, all right? Like in the pine situation here, the slash pine, when, when we're clearing the score, the center plot of the slash pine forest, uh, some of you are helping out there, pulling weeds and cutting down branches and so forth. Uh, in this little core that we have of the forest, there are uh, two dozen mature slash pine, about 24 of them. But we have discovered about 300 seedlings, 300 babies, slash pine. So how many seedlings does it take to replace the mature pines in that plot? I just gave you the numbers. How many mature, how many adult pines do we have in there? About two dozen, 24, all right? And we have 300 seedlings. Do we need 300 seedlings? No, that's overkill. We absolutely, that would be too much actually. It's too much of a good thing. We actually need, how many of those seedlings do we need to survive into adulthood, into mature pines? 24 <laughs> to replace the current population. That will keep it stable, you see? So there is replacement. So that means that most of the juveniles don't make it to reproductive age, okay? Or if they make it to reproductive age, in other words, if they make it to adulthood, adulthood defined as sexual organs being mature, right? If they make it to adulthood, they don't actually get to reproduce. They could be like the beta male, right? That didn't get to reproduce, or they could be the female that did not get to reproduce either. So the vast majority of juveniles either don't make it to adulthood, or if they do make it to adulthood, they don't get to reproduce, all right? So that's another observation that he noticed. And that's what's keeping these populations more or less stable because, hey, every zebra in there in principle is reproducing, right? All right, so also he noticed that typically the resources are limited. There are no unlimited resources on earth, okay? Even light, for example, sunlight, which we would consider sunlight unlimited on an average day, there's much more sunlight that the plants actually need on any given day. That sunlight is gonna end at nightfall, <laughs> okay? And so even that over time, as short as a single day, that light is going to end periodically, you know, for a period of time. And so resources are always limited, and therefore that is the selective pressure. Because resources are limited, all of these organisms are competing for the same resources. They're all competing for the same resources, okay? 
And so that's a, the selected pressure is on. Mm -hmm. That is the selected pressure. Okay. Another a couple of observations was that no two individuals within any given population are exactly alike. So variation, okay? Variety rules. That was my whole point about the identical twins. If there is variation among identical twins, monozygotic twins, at the morphological, physiological, behavioral, and molecular level, then there is certainly variation among any other individual of that species, of that population. You follow? Okay, so the rule for Darwin, he was focusing on the difference instead of the similarities among individuals of the same population. So the probability of survival of each individual varies depending on the complexity of variations that each individual has, all right? And this is a very complex issue for each individual because it's any combination of any trait, any particular trait of the dozens or hundreds. If you take it down to the metabolic level, we have thousands of different traits, right? Think of all the metabolic pathways. So variation rules, and he was focusing on that because that's, a, that's the detail, that's the level of the detail. Even variations that we may not see, but other animals may see. For example, in the infrared or the ultraviolet range, which we do not see. Think of the dog whistle, for example, that we don't hear, but the dog hears. Okay, many of these variations are inheritable, inheritable. okay? If the variation can be traced to a particular gene, then that gene may be passed on to the next generation. So there's a mechanism for inheriting variations. Mm -hmm. Over many, many generations, this inheritance of variants may, may lead to speciation, to the point that the variants are so different from each other that they're no longer recognizing each other and they're not interbreeding. They're only breeding within the individuals that they can actually recognize, within the variants that they recognize. We are, if that is happening, we are on the way to speciation, to a new species altogether arising, okay? Another way of saying that is evolution. Okay, let's look, let's look briefly at an example of each one of these for a slide, and we are now at what time? Okay. Coming up to 11, wow. Uh, let me go a little bit and uh, I'll stop in a little while. People need a break yet or no? Let's go forward. Okay, so first observation. Again, they don't have to be in this sequence, right? They don't occur chronologically. They, they occur simultaneously because we're looking at nature. So first observation, overabundance of gametes or overabundance of zygotes. Uh, look at this cloud. You see this yellow cloud? What, what trees are these? What's sticking out of these trees? Oh, the resolution, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, at least from the branching, these are pine trees. I'm sorry about the resolution. I'm trying to get a TV screen in here, okay? All right, yeah, so I can tell you that these are pine trees. These are cones, the little brown dots that you're seeing here. The light brown, these are cones, so they're pine cones. So they're pine trees, they're conifers. And this cloud, which on the screen looks uh, white, is actually yellow, uh, that's pollen. Those are pollen grains, okay? What's pollen? It's sperm. There are two sperm nuclei inside each pollen grain. So there's the overabundance of, uh, of um, gametes. Here's a micrograph, a microscopic photograph of pollen. These are pollen grains, very different types of shapes, very different colors. This is not colorized, also the natural real colors. Okay, they come in all colors and shapes, but pollen is super abundant. Of course, not every one of these pollen grains is gonna fertilize because if it did, it would be absolutely insane over production, okay? Uh, here's an example of a puff mushroom. Puff mushroom is uh, these are not uh, pollen or eggs, these are spores, these are spores. And this is a cloud of spores, millions of spores, okay? This is a micrograph of those spores over here, individually under the microscope. 
potentially each one of these little dots, each one of these pores could generate a new mushroom. Is that gonna happen? No, otherwise the world would be just covered with mushroom and nothing else would fit here, right? Okay, so overabundance of production. Again, sprouts, not all of these sprouts are going to survive. We only need uh, two to replace the parents if it was sexual reproduction, and these are sprouts coming from seeds, and seeds come from sexual reproduction. Again, overproduction of mushrooms, the, uh, what are these called, the dandelions, each one of these seeds would produce a new plant, okay, overabundance. Fish eggs, these are little embryos, little zygotes, most of these zygotes are destined to be eaten, 99.999% because in nature we cannot take out the male, <laughs> all right? Or the female that also becomes hungry and turns around eating its own eggs. Here's a female crab loaded with eggs, all right? It only takes one of these eggs to replace her. So the overabundance, abundantly illustrated, okay? The vast majority of these gametes and zygotes, they become food for the uh, chain, for the food chain. Next, okay, this has to do with the uh, stable population, which is known as a population growth curve and the carrying capacity, normally uh, referenced as K. K stands for, capital K stands for the carrying capacity, all right, it's a number. And it's the number of individuals of that population, of that species in that population, carrying capacity. And the number of individuals of that species in that population, the number of zebras in population A in that pod, in that patch of uh, prairie in Africa, it starts very slowly. This is called the lag phase lag because it lags. It's typically a geometric progression. If we follow mitosis, for example, from one cell we get two, from two, four, from four, eight. It's geometric, it's a duplication because each cell duplicates, right? Mitosis, each cell duplicates. So the, the original phase is slow. It's called a lag, L-A-G. Then it starts at some point, it goes exponential. It goes into the log phase, L-O-G. You know, when we get from 1632, 64, 132, uh, no, 64, 64, 128, double of 128, pretty fast as you double that number, it goes into the thousands, into the hundreds of thousands, into the millions, okay? So that's the log phase for every next generation under ideal conditions. There's plenty of supplies here. There's plenty of nourishment of resources. At some point, because the resources are limited in nature, these animals or plants or fungi, whatever it is, bacteria, they're gonna start running out of nutrients. They're gonna start running out of space. And so they're gonna start dying off. Typically the weakers are the ones who die off first. At some point, you get to replacement level. In other words, the number of births equals the number of deaths, and that's the carrying capacity for that particular ecosystem, okay? And so it happens that the vast majority of juveniles don't make it to adulthood. Here's a baby turtle being eaten by an adult crab because the one turtle laid dozens of eggs. And we only need one baby turtle to survive to adulthood to replace his or her mother, and then another one to replace the father, okay? So the mass majority of juveniles, sadly, they don't make it, or, well, it's just a balancing thing. And even in adulthood, uh, here is just a photograph of uh, chimpanzees. This is probably most likely, just from the action, from the photo, this is most likely the alpha male. You can see that he's pretty muscular, and also he's actually holding a stick, which he's using as a weapon. Very interesting, using a, an instrument, using an artifact as a weapon, all right? Which he's not gonna kill the other monkey, but he's going to threaten the other monkey, all right? And it's display, it's called a threatening display. So the alpha male is shooing away other males 
and maybe this is the female because she looks to be in this in the more passive uh, posture. The problem with uh, chimpanzees is that they have no bimorphism, meaning that the male and the female are essentially the same size and shape, right? So you can't really tell them apart from their shape, but you can tell them apart from their behavior. The, uh, the, male, is, the male is very aggressive and the male will beat on the female and it's, he's very aggressive. Uh, at any rate, the alpha male is probably trying to push off some beta males. And so the beta males will not get to mate with the female, with this female, all right? Even though they're adults, they are not as, as strong. Okay, moving forward. So what does it mean for the beta male? That the beta, beta male genes are not gonna be passed on. It will be the alpha male genes that will be passed on, okay? Uh, another observation, the limited resources. Here are some moose in winter. Uh, this moose is only going to find probably a female because it doesn't have the antlers. Uh, is, is going to find limited little uh, twigs of uh, this looks like a birch that she can eat. All right, so whatever female moose, whatever moose can manage with those little twigs will make it through. Once the first moose goes through this patch of uh, birch, there are no longer sufficient twigs to feed the next moose. So the first moose that got to the batch was the one that uh, ate the limited resources, <laughs> okay? Uh, very graphic, when we look at this uh, river, we see that this river is meandering through a plain that is rather dry, but right on the banks of the river, on both banks of the river, very lush because those trees are the ones that get to the limited resource of liquid water, right? Okay, so very graphic limited resource here. The limited resource here is definitely liquid water. Mm -hmm. Look at this, uh, sadly a plastic bottle that floated on the ocean surface long enough to get adult barnacles to encrust the whole colony of adult barnacles. The larva of the barnacle is uh, free swimming, it's part of the plankton, it's part of the zooplankton, but it's looking for a place to anchor and grow into adulthood. So here is the limited resource of the bottle, okay? Any larva barnacle that got to this bottle after these guys is out of luck, doesn't have a foothold because the limited resource of the space. Uh, here are vultures fighting for a carcass. Again, the strongest vultures or the ones who got there earlier are probably gonna be the ones who feed on the carcass. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these are just from the photo, this looks like a grown adult because of the, not only the behavioral display, but also the coloration of the neck and the face. These look like juveniles. They look like they still have down on them, the little baby feathers. Okay, so these juveniles probably have to wait their turn until the adults ate enough so they can come in and see if there's anything left on the carcass. Limited resources, very understandable. Uh, the last observation, the variety. These are all, uh, uh, are these called uh, giraffes? You can see the giraffes, they're all the same species but no two individual giraffes have the same pattern. Hmm? No two have the same pattern. Aside from the one here that is super fat, <laughs> chubby, has a beer belly. <laughs> but aside from that, the pattern is very different. They're all giraffes, humans, faces. Uh, these are plants from, these are, these are macaws. These are not, not macaw, but this is a, a, um, a snail from Cuba that is endemic. It's, a, it's an endangered species and it has these beautiful shells. And the downside is that they're so beautiful that uh, people take them, okay? But uh, these are all the same species, look at that. Also in flowers, the same species of uh, wild lily is showing three different patterns. And even stuff we don't see, here's another lily uh, in um, the visible spectrum of light. Visible spectrum of light is what we see in between 
infrared and ultraviolet. And here is, I think this is an infrared photograph of the same exact lily. So you can see it's the same patch, right? But look at the pattern, it's so different. We don't see in this range, but it seems to be pretty evident that some insects see in that range. They could be most likely bees, or it could be some, ber some birds, uh, hummingbirds, but most likely it will be bees that can see in that range. They see that pattern, we don't, okay? And bees, you know, are great pollinators. Oh yeah, sorry, there's one last observation, which is uh, the biggest one, all right? And I'll stop here with this example. Uh, many of these variations are heritable. They're passed on to the next generation, uh, especially if there was a chance mutation that occurred, mostly on the gametes, okay? And then that chance mutation would express in the next generation. Uh, Long period of time may not have to be that, that long, may not have to be billions or even millions of years. So it's one example that's pretty drastic. Uh, Lake Victoria and two other lakes that are associated with uh, the great, uh, the um, uh, Rift Valley in Western uh, Central Africa here is Lake Tanganyika and Lake Malawi. These three lakes, okay, are in this region of the uh, Rift Valley. And this is also archeologically, anyone heard of the Rift Valley, the Great Rift Valley? There's a movie I highly recommend. It's, it's a lot of fun movie, but has a lot of insight. It's called The Gods, are, the Gods, um, the Gods are Crazy, The Gods Become Crazy, The Gods, The Gods Are Crazy. It was a student movie, it was done by, by students in, uh, well, I don't, get, I don't get it off track. Let me, let me stay on point so we can take a break. <laughs> Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika and uh, Lake Malawi are in this region of Africa, okay, which dried out in one of these desertification cycles. So we know that there are long-term cycles that cause desertification, which you see here. The Sahara Desert is expanding into uh, Central Africa. The equator is around here somewhere uh, in the Congo Basin, right? The other lung of the world, which is the Congo Basin, the other one being uh, the Amazon Basin over here in, Central, in South America, Amazon Basin. Anyway, um, the interface is called the Sahel between the Sahara and the, the uh, tropical uh, rainforest. So there have been cycles of desertification and tropicalization of Africa that go into hundreds of thousands of years, uh, sometimes millions of years, but hundreds of thousands. Okay, so it involves many, many, many human generations. But uh, there was the last desertification that occurred in this uh, Rift Valley region of these three large lakes occurred uh, several hundred thousand years ago, uh, sorry, not even, about less than 20,000 years ago, about 17,000 years ago, all right? These lakes were dry. Now, these lakes also have uh, certain uh, species of fish that are endemic to those lakes, or used to be before they were exported by the aquarium industry, the cichlids, the cichlids or cyclids, but the cichlids are very uh, beautiful fish. They're also very territorial and very aggressive. That makes part for their um, uh, speciation and diversity. Cichlids, they actually depends where they live on the lake uh, and what the particular niche, what habitat they have in the lake uh, near the bottom or near the surface, uh, along the slope of the lake going down uh, into depth or uh, higher above, etc. They will have different shapes because they're feeding on different organisms and so forth. And so they have different patterns that are very striking patterns, okay? And it's mostly the male that tends to be more elegant and the, the female is selecting 
on the pattern of the male. So you can see the great variation of patterns, of colors and shapes of the animal as a whole, all right? Again, these are cichlids. You can buy them in aquarium shops today, but they tend to be very territorial. So they're aggressive and they go after other fish. They end up being the only fish in the tank. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, anyway, this Lake Victoria was dry 17,000 years ago. Today, and then it was refilled about 3,000 years later, <laughs> okay? So 14, we're actually talking about 14,000 years ago. That's nothing, that's a speck. And when you put that at the level of millions of years, you know, what's 14,000 years? Well, this is the variety of cichlids that exists today in this lake that was dried out, okay, uh, 14,000 years ago. So we have seen this speciation and these guys definitely don't mix these different species. These are definitely different species. Biological species by Pyar's definition, they do not interbreed, all right? So we've had this level of speciation, all right, in 14,000 years in this lake that has been geographically isolated and other two uh, lakes, uh, again, Tanganyika and uh, Malawi, that are part of the same complex of lakes and there are rivers that connect them and so forth. So here we have an example of variations that are heritable and have led to a branching variation to a, a branching expansion and led to speciation, to speciation. Okay. So we have one evidence here, but we only observe the result. In other words, we observe all the varieties of cichlids that are in these lakes, uh, these African lakes today. Okay, uh, on this slide, I'm gonna get into other aspects of uh, niche and habitat and so forth. So this is a good uh, time to take a break. Any questions or comments from these five observations and their corresponding inferences? I do, I have one. Yep, go for it. Um, so when we were talking about the um, developmental genes and um, the improbabilities of whether the um, life form is vital or not. Yes. Um, what happens when in, in the case of humans, when mm -hmm. there's a miscarriage because of that, is there a soul in that, in that body or there is no soul? Again, excellent question. Uh, and we're going to look at it in more detail. Believe me, we're going to go into luxury of detail just in a, in a couple of months, three months, when we start the beginning of life uh, bioethics course, okay? And we'll start again back to the molecular level with the DNA level, and we'll build up on that, gametogenesis, how the egg and sperm are produced, and then the whole process of fertilization beginning with the first cell forward, and so many, when and so many may happen, you know, uh, what happens with the soul of a person. So again, my answer, uh, the short answer would be, it depends, it depends how gross was the malformation? Did, did it meet the requirements for being a human being, but a highly deformed human being? Or was it actually not a human being at all? There's something called a teratoma, that occurs in humans and mammals in general. Let me see if I can get to the internet. And teratomas are tissues, bundles of tissues that grow sometimes in women's womb and they are kind of mimicking a, a also, no, I don't know if it's going to come out here. They're maybe king a pregnancy, but they're not a pregnancy. Okay. And sometimes they're also called Hyda TD form moles. That's another word that's more sophisticated. Hyda TD form mole. And the first impression is that they're gross looking but they actually have pieces, pieces of uh, tissue in them. 
I was just trying to look for some one that is more, actually this one, the teratoma is more informative. Look at this. Okay. Uh, it looks like here, these are teeth. These are eyeball sockets. Okay. This may be the remnant of a lip, but that's the whole thing right there. All right. So, uh, it's beginning to look like a face, but there's nothing behind it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have to be careful. Is this a human or not? Mm -hmm. There's another one. It's got bits and pieces of tissues and organs that could be recognized as humanoid, but is it really human? Uh, it's very hard to tell. Uh, only God knows, literally, if this qualified as a human or not. But definitely, if um, at the end of the day, and I don't, I don't say this uh, nonchalantly, who cares in the sense that if it's a miscarriage, that creature died, right? And is now dead and it's being discarded and it will be processed typically as medical waste. Now, if it was human or not, only God knows. But if he was human, then what happened? Then that baby died. Just like, let's say, a normal human may also die in pregnancy, right? And be like a normal miscarriage, let's say, that baby died. So that soul also died. And the fetus went to uh, the glory of God. And only God knows, okay? But so whether it was human or not to begin with, that's the big question. If this zygote received a soul from God or not, that's a big question. We'll never really know, right? But at the end of the day, really, who knows, who cares in the sense that if it did have a soul, then that soul uh, went to heaven the minute that that human died and was discarded from uh, his or her mother's womb. But we'll never really know, okay? There is also another case that is uh, very wrenching that is called the anencephalic babies. All right, and what happens with anencephalic is like, just like the word says, anen is uh, without a brain, without a cephalus, all right, without a cephalus. Now look at these babies here. They have a face, they have a body, but you notice that they have a shrunken skull. It's another one. They are missing a brain. They're missing a brain. Most of them die during the embryonic uh, process, either as embryos or as fetuses, and they are typically miscarriages, but some actually make it to birth. Hmm. I would say my impression, if anyone asked me, this baby definitely has a soul, okay? Doesn't have a brain or may have a very, very tiny minuscule brain. They typically, what's your intuition? Do they survive? They don't survive. They either die at birth or around birth. Uh, many times they're just giving a cap so they look more normal, okay? Some may survive for a few days, a few weeks. Some may survive even longer, depending on how much of a brain stem they have, because the brain stem is the one that controls uh, heartbeat and lung, right? This kid is obviously not on life support. She's not on a respirator. She's breathing. It looks like a girl to me, but I don't know. Okay, this one is probably one or two years old. All right, who knows how long they're gonna live? But I would say that this definitely has a soul. <laughs> this uh, little baby girl here, but she has a very, very tiny brain. They can be anencephalic or they can be microcephalic, all right? Or they can be hydrocephalic, which is water in the brain or fluid. For hydrocephaly, then we can get into fetal surgery. The little tiny shunts that can be put, tiny shunts that can be put inside the fetus to drain the fluid from the brain. So hydrocephaly can be uh, can be treated with fetal surgery. That was my first dissertation from, from Rome. If fetuses can be patients, why are they not human, <laughs> you know? 
a fetus is a patient, is a clinical patient, has to be a human person to be treated as clinically, right? As a patient. So uh, it, again, it depends what, how, how severe is the anomaly, when the anomaly occurs, et cetera. But we can say that teratomas, without question, teratomas really are not uh, human beings. They have human tissues and maybe human organs in them, but it's not a functional human being, whether they're teratomas or hydatidiform moles. Okay, it's a mass. Mm -hmm. But uh, anencephalic, yes, most likely. They have a soul, they're gonna die soon, all right? They should be baptized, for example, okay? And so forth, okay? So anomalies do occur in nature, thanks God that they are very rare, and certainly they don't make it to reproductive age. So whatever deformities were there are likely not gonna be passed on. They're not gonna be passed on. Okay. Uh, we'll get more into uh, the soul and the granting of a soul uh, when we look at uh, the beginning of life issues in next semester. So in a couple of months, more or less, uh, about three months. Time for a break. Where were we? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's see, it is 11.23, okay, I'll start again at uh, what, 11.45, okay, 11.45, okay, I'll see you then. Yes, it's freezing in here, let me, Pause recording. Welcome back, everyone. Here we're going to the second half here. Uh, going beyond these uh, five observations and inferences, we have to cover a few more uh, terms also, uh, which is uh, niche and habitat, right? These are technical terms that have a very specific meaning. So the niche is the role that an animal or an organism plays in nature. Okay. Uh, the role of an organism in nature, how it fits into the ecosystem. And uh, typically niches are also associated with a place, a geographical place. And so it associates with a habitat. For example, these are just some uh, samples uh, again, talking about the prairie in Africa. Here is uh, sadly a dead zebra that was likely hunted down by this lioness here, all right? So how many individuals or how many different species do we see here? Hmm? We see a zebra that is dead. We see a lioness. We see some vultures. Then there's a hyena here that is kind of out of focus. She's waiting her turn or he's waiting his turn. The hyena is waiting the turn for the lion to finish <laughs> feeding. Even on the background, you can tell very faintly this brown blurbs here. That's some kind of a herd that is out there on the horizon. Uh, kind of hard to tell, but uh, that's likely what that is. It's a herd of some animals that is on the, on the horizon there. Anyway, there are different um, roles here. For example, the zebra is a herbivore, so that zebra is gonna be feeding on the grass. The most impact of the zebra is going to be on the grass, on the, on the prairie itself, on the savanna. Whereas the lion is definitely a carnivore, okay? Uh, so the lion is going to be hunting, needs to hunt down its prey live. Uh, whereas the, the vultures are scavengers, they typically don't hunt down prey, they're opportunistic, they will feed on the carcass. 
but someone else did the killing. And the hyenas are scavengers, but hyenas can also hunt. So they're kind of borderline. That's each one of these animals here has a role in to play in the African savanna. But don't forget that the grass also has a role to play, all right, as a producer, producer of food of glucose and cellulose for uh, the herbivores to feed on it. So when we talk about niche role of an organism, it's not just animals, it's also plants. We can take it further down into the level of the uh, fungi that may be living here or actually underground, uh, under the soil, and even the bacteria that are in this scenario, they also have a role to play, okay? So those are all the major kingdoms are represented there or the domains. Natures and habitats can be either continuous or discontinuous. Continuous in when there is a flow of individuals from one population to another. For example, these are aphids. I don't know if you know about aphids, but aphids are little uh, insect-like uh, creatures that live on twigs and branches of plants. And they kind of uh, parasitic because they suck out um, nectar or they suck out uh, phloem, they suck out juices from the plants, all right? Now, it all depends on how many aphids the plant has, if the plant becomes overwhelmed or not, but the plant can typically tolerate populations of aphids that will migrate from one population to the other. And so there's kind of a continuous distribution of these little creatures. Um, aphids themselves serve as um, a herd for some ants, and some ants milk these aphids uh, with their rear legs. The ants will stimulate the abdomen of the aphid to produce a little mm, ball, a little tiny bead of uh, nectar that uh, the aphid can produce. And then the ant will take that nectar to the ant hill, uh, the ant hole underneath, the ant uh, colony and uh, use it to feed the fungi that are growing on the ground and so forth. So aphid themselves serve as uh, herd, as cows <laughs> for the, uh, for the uh, ants. Very uh, interesting stuff. But basically the individuals can migrate from one population to the other, all right? So it's kind of a continuous uh, niche. Whereas this continuous, means that they have their own geographical region. That geographical region can be very small scale. For example, lichens stuck to a rock, all right? Uh, definitely they are not continuous, but uh, discrete or discontinuous or patchy. Each lichen can be defined, very well defined with its uh, natural border, all right? And they can either be at a small scale or a large scale. I also want to mention that lichens are pioneer species. We saw it in succession briefly because they secrete um, certain acids that, that uh, corrode the stone, the rock, and they dissolve the rock into basic minerals can then be absorbed by other plants. So they essentially over a long period of time generate a little bit of a soil minerals for other plants to come into the area and colonize the area. Lichens also are a symbiosis between fungi and algae. They are, the structure is basically a fungus, but algae grow inside. And so that's a niche within a niche. The, the, uh, the lichen has its own niche as it's attached to the rock, but then the algae that live inside for a particular function and the niche of that algae is the actual lichen itself where the algae will photosynthesize, right? And produce glucose food for the fungus because the fungus is a saprophyte, will feed on the glucose that the algae is producing. And in exchange, the fungus will give a liquid environment for the algae to live, a liquid micro environment inside. Um, and semi-transparent walls so that the algae can actually photosynthesize on top of a piece of rock. <laughs> okay, so it's an interesting uh, symbiosis. Uh, 
large discontinuous uh, niches and habitats can also be different continents where we have, for example, the old world monkeys in Africa and the new world monkeys in uh, Latin America. The old world monkeys living, for example, in the Congo Basin and the new world monkeys living in, um, uh, in the Brazilian uh, rainforest, okay? So basically the role that each organism plays in nature and the combination of these roles then forms an entire ecosystem when we include the, uh, the abiotic, the non-living factors into the equation. Moving forward, let's look at selection, which is a process of elimination. I'm going down your outline here, all right? The uh, selection process is a process of elimination, very much like sports, you know, in sports, uh, there are winners and there are losers. And generally, on average, the winner team is somehow more fit than the losing team, at least for that particular game in that, in that uh, game in that moment. All right, so here we see, for example, the competition is between these three uh, grizzly bears, right, to catch the salmon. And so we can see that these uh, three bears, they don't have, oh, they're not exhibiting at this particular moment when the photograph is taken, they're not exhibiting the same skills. Certainly uh, this front bear here, this first bear is the one that's exhibiting the most uh, skill to catch the flying salmon, okay? The swimming salmon as it's leaping up, uh, up uh, upstream. So it looks like this most uh, reaching out uh, bear is going to catch the salmon, uh, whereas this one is watching. Hopefully if the first one misses, the second one will catch, the second bear will catch it. Uh, but this one back here, the third bear seems to be more concerned about the current and uh, doesn't want to get too much on the edge. There must be rocks here or something. Uh, but then again, it's a chance thing because in the enthusiasm of catching that salmon, if this bear slips on that, wherever he has a foothold or she has a foothold, then that salmon, that uh, bear is gonna go tumbling down and may get selected out. <laughs> okay, so you see there's a determinism and there's chance. There's behavior here involved, right? There's also morphology and physiology involved, uh, but there's also chance that at that moment, let's say a log came by and hit this uh, bear on the rump of a, of a log that happened to come by at that moment and pushed the bear off the edge. So even though he had the most skill, he got hit by a log. So that was serendipity. That was a stochastic process, okay? So you see there's determinism and there is chance involved. It's a combination of both really. And Meyer makes that point in his uh, textbook. Okay, but uh, the big uh, thing about here, the message here is that it's a, it's a selecting out. The more fit, select out the less fit. On average, on average, statistically speaking. All right, now this selection is a two-step process. And what is the boundary between the two steps is the zygote, is fertilization, all right? Uh, so we have a pre-zygotic uh, selection and we have a post-zygotic selection. Let's look at that for a moment. Let me just make sure that I'm recording again. Uh, yeah. You are. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so zygote is the fertilized egg, okay? So pre-zygotic, pre-zygotic is anywhere from the development of the sex cells through a process called gametogenesis, all right, which is a meiosis, it's a double mitosis process, double mitosis. There's a first mitosis here, and then there's a second mitosis uh, here with a little twist of uh, the reduction of the number of chromosomes to the single number from diploid to haploid. At any rate, that's what is called meiosis. Uh, there can be selection occurring here at any point here, all right? Pre-selection in these cells in the process, it didn't happen correctly or there was aneuploidy, for example, the sticking of chromosomes into one uh, cell and then leaving another cell with fewer chromosomes. So defects or selecting out can happen in the meiosis process. 
which generally is what we call gametogenesis process. It could be at the level of the cells or it could be at the level of the actual organs, even the ovaries or the testicles that uh, undergo some kind of impact and don't do the process well. Or it can happen in the actual gametes themselves, whether it is the egg or the sperm, they can uh, malfunction for a number of reasons, okay? And also in the fertilization process, we see tremendous selection happening in fertilization process. Again, in anticipation of uh, next uh, course, mm, how many sperm, hypothetically, how many sperm does it take to fertilize one egg? One sperm. Oh. I'm talking about mammals in general, I'm talking about any, any uh, living species, okay, that undergoes sexual reproduction, one sperm fertilizes one egg because that completes the diploid number of chromosomes. However, for the human uh, sperm, for semen to be considered competent, physiologically competent, clinically competent, all right, to be able to fertilize, the human ejaculate is supposed to have, anybody know how many sperm? Hundreds, thousands, millions, millions, between 100 to 150 million sperm in a competent ejaculate to be considered clinically capable of fertilizing, all right? So that's functionally where it's at for, at least for the human, which is the numbers that I know, but it's very typical for mammals in general. There is an overabundance and it's an extreme overabundance of uh, sperm in any, in any uh, fertilization process, okay, in nature. And that is because there is a tremendous selective pressure against sperm. That's precisely what is called capacitation. How strong, how vigorous the sperm is, where the tail is functioning correctly, the flagellum, whether the, the flagellum is, is uh, vigorous enough. All the, the, the biochemical stuff that needs to happen for that sperm to fertilize that egg, all right, is part of the uh, selective process. So that only the most vigorous, on average, only the strongest, most capacitated, most vigorous sperm is the one that reaches that egg. And the idea behind that is that supposedly that sperm is carrying the best genes, the most vigorous genes. See, and so there is tremendous selective pressure against uh, sperm in the process of fertilization. That's a good thing because that means that on average, the first sperm is the one that fertilizes and then those uh, stronger genes are the ones that are transmitted on to the next generation. And on average, that's why most of us are normal uh, when we're born because the abnormal got selected out. Either the weaker sperm didn't uh, fertilize or the weaker embryo got selected out. We also have one of the highest uh, rates of uh, spontaneous abortion and miscarriage in, in nature. Uh, globally, it's about 50%, meaning that about half of human pregnancies never make it to term. And I'm not talking about an abortion clinic, I'm talking about a natural spontaneous loss, about half. That's huge, that's a very high. That means that on average, we all have a sibling that we never met, <laughs> you know, that died in the embryonic stage because they had some kind of genetic defect, okay? That was incompatible with life. So all of that selection is pre-zygotic, all right? Before the zygote is formed. Uh, there are different factors that are involved in, in that pre-zygotic selection. After fertilization, now we have a zygote, which is the first cell of the new individual. Then that zygote has to undergo embryonic, pro uh, embryonic process, be born, grow into a mature adult, and have their own children, because that's the definition of, uh, of, um, of a species, right? That can interbreed and produce viable offspring. And biologically, we're no different, so the same uh, definition has to apply to us. Post-zygotic selection, so selection can occur any time after the zygote is, is uh, formed, all right? So post-zygotic selection is gonna include all of these stages, the embryonic stage until the baby is born nine months later. Again, a woman can lose that pregnancy naturally without any human interference in it, all right? 
uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, like I say, typically about half of human pregnancies never make it to term, they're lost. That is also a selection. So we can say there that the selective process for gestation for the nine months of pregnancy is about two to one, whereby only one of every two zygotes actually makes it to a baby, okay? Again, necessary, but not sufficient. A lot still needs to happen for years, for decades, for this baby to be fully viable into adulthood, all right? So a selection can happen along the way for the baby, for the child, the toddler, the teenager, all of those, all of those individuals at those stages can get selected out, you know, tragically, but it can happen. So post-zygotic is going to include from the zygote all the way to adulthood, including birth and all the developmental years up until reproductive adulthood. Okay, so adulthood again in nature is defined by the maturation of the uh, sex organs that the ovaries are beginning to produce mature eggs, essentially the first ovulation, the testes are beginning to produce a mature sperm, all right? And so that needs to happen to become adult, necessary, but still not sufficient. Then two adults of the opposite sex still need to mate, right? And so uh, mating needs to happen. In other words, they need to find each other and form a couple, which is also necessary, but still not sufficient for the procreation of the species as a whole, that couple needs to be uh, reproductively capable of producing an offspring. So the couple not only needs to find each other, they need to have a baby, <laughs> at least. And then that is also necessary, but still not sufficient. There's one last day that's going to uh, be needed. In the case of the human, that's going to take an average of about 15 to 20 more years at least, which is for this baby to grow into adulthood and see if this baby is a fertile, you see? Because the whole idea is for the adults to produce fertile offspring. And we won't know that until that baby grows to adulthood and actually reproduces or procreates. So the final photo is three generations. And uh, hopefully from what we can tell in the photo, these are the grandparents, these are the parents, and these are the grandchildren, right? And so the hope is that uh, these, are, these grandparents are actually the couple that generated either this uh, young man or this young woman, right? And then uh, this is also a couple that generated these uh, kids here, okay? So hopefully and these are the children of this couple here, and hopefully this couple here, the parents, are not siblings, but they're just uh, two individual adults who met and fell in love and had these children. But uh, the idea is that at least one of these two adults, one of these two parents is the son or daughter of these older couple of the grandparents, <laughs> follow? Okay, and the other one is either the uh, son-in-law or the daughter-in-law. <laughs> But that's the idea here. Now, when we have this kind of picture, then we can see that this uh, couple of grandparents have uh, produced children who themselves are uh, fertile, okay? That's the whole argument there. So, from this stage of gametogenesis to fertilis to the zygote is prezygotic selection. And it is very intense to the tune of uh, 100 million or 150 million to one, <laughs> at least, uh, just in the process of fertilization. Then after fertilization, from birth or from embryonic development, again, only half of, human, of humanity is born after fertilization, okay? Uh, so for example, if all of humanity that was fertilized were alive, we would have uh, 16 billion people on earth instead of uh, 8 billion. <laughs> and then that baby, once the baby is born, has to make it all the way to reproductive success. 
and then even wait to see if their offspring is also fertile when their offspring reproduces. Imagine, not all couples actually get to meet, uh, not all couples are actually fertile or do have children for whatever reason, et cetera, et cetera. So you see that there is selection along the way happening really all the time, right? All the time. Okay, so pre-zygotic and post-zygotic selection, it, it's uh, determined by uh, fertilization. Another uh, concept that is important is the idea of um, the competitive exclusion principle. Oh yes, I'm sorry, I have another little phrase here that um, selection is a mixture of determinism and chance. Let me go back uh, one slide here for a moment. Okay. It's a mixture of determinism and chance. Let's say that, uh, you know, this couple may have met or this couple may not have met. Maybe they met because uh, uh, they were living, they were next door neighbors. They happened to move uh, next door to the apartments uh, next door or the next door dorms when they were studying in college. Or maybe it happened that they were in two different countries and they never met. Okay, so there's chance involved in the process and there's also determinism. There's determinism when young people are actively seeking out a couple, all right, to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. There's certainly determinism in there because the human will is engaged in looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend but uh, the chances are that that boyfriend or girlfriend is gonna happen with someone who is nearby, not someone who is on the other side of the world, okay? And so there's chance and determinism because people, I was born here and not there, et cetera, or I grew up here and not there. So you see the mixture of chance and determinism, right? That is involved in this, there's human will, there is also instinct on the part of nature, but there's also chance involved in the process. Okay, another con concept is this concept of competitive exclusion. We're looking at selection and we're looking at selecting out, right? Which is natural selection. Uh, it doesn't have a mind as such like artificial selection, but it does have uh, instinct and it does have certain laws by which it applies, okay? And so uh, these laws are the laws of nature. And one of those laws is this competitive exclusion principle, okay? And that uh, competitive exclusion principle says this, that there are any two species, two different species, right? By definition, two species are two different species. They may be closely related, but they're two different species that are living in the same habitat, all right? And that would be like they're sharing the same niche. Uh, they will uh, compete with each other so that at some point, one species will exclude the other one, all right? So over a period of time, and typically it's fairly soon, fairly fast, one species will outcompete the other one, all right? Because they're competing for the same resources. And that is called the competitive exclusion principle. Hmm? The competitive exclusion principle. So here's just a very uh, caricature, excuse me. Uh, we have a tree with little black bugs on it and the black bugs are on the trunk and on the canopy of the tree. And then these yellow birds come around and the yellow birds start feeding on the black bugs. Everything is peachy keen until another species of birds arrives and the other species is a, is a red bird and the red birds seem to be a little larger than the yellow birds. So what's going to happen is that the red birds seem to do better, they're better at picking the bugs on the trunk, which is more barren, okay? And they start displacing the yellow birds. So the yellow birds are constrained to go into the canopy where they have more protection. And actually smaller size does better in the canopy and larger size does better on the trunk because it's more barren, okay? 
So at some point, the, there will be a redistribution of niches and habitats so that uh, one species will be more successful in one part of the tree and the other species will be constrained to another part of the tree, even though the other species can eat the same food, right? The same um, uh, resources than the one species. Okay, so that's the competitive exclusion principle. Oh yeah, the yellow birds all, also went down to the ground because they can hide now inside, they can navigate the, uh, the, uh, the ground cover down there better than the big red birds, okay? So that's the competitive exclusion principle. And it happens at, in all the um, domains that we saw and all the kingdoms, the animal kingdom, plants, fungi, protists, or microscopic, and also in bacteria and archaea. This happens in all living organisms that we find uh, in nature. Moving forward, we can ask the question, I'm basically reviewing chapter six of Meyer here, uh, what does selection act on or upon? You know, what is selection acting on? What is it acting on? First, it will act on the phenotype of the individual, of individual organisms. So that's the first um, encounter of selection. It's on the phenotype of the individual because it's about adaptability, right? It's how well adapted an organism is to its environment. How well adapted is the organism, all right? So for example, uh, birds are better adapted to tetrapods, to terrestrial animals, when it comes to uh, a carnivore, top carnivore hunting. So it's easier for a carnivore to hunt down a zebra than to hunt down um, a, what was that? A vulture, because the vulture can fly away. All right. Uh, so the, the, the phenotype is the first target of selection, the phenotype of individual organisms. For example, where they were looking at uh, the protists, which are typically single cell organisms like amoeba or colonial like the algae, fungi, plants, animals, all of these is going to be the phenotype, all right? So the phenotype is both stable and evolvable. It is stable as we look at it now, all right? If we look outside the window, if we look beyond these walls and we see a nature out there, we see a dynamic stability whereby the animals and plants and the fungi and all the living creatures that are there are in a carrying capacity. So for example, the number of squirrels at St. Thomas University is a stable population of squirrels. Periodically, a squirrel will die either of old age or because it was taken down typically by a hawk, all right, uh, or a falcon. And so uh, those squirrels are being replaced by the baby squirrels that are growing in, in, on campus right now. So there's a stable dynamic stability of the number of squirrels on campus. But it's also evolvable because selection is acting on variation, right? And because there are variants, some squirrels are faster than others. Some are more agile than others. And so some squirrels can jump faster, et cetera, can hide from the hawk better than other squirrels. The slower squirrels on average are gonna be eaten by the hawk, okay? So it's also evolvable. The, the, the hawk pressure on the squirrel population here at St. Thomas is such that uh, the, the, the better, the most fit squirrels are the ones that are going to survive. If at some point the hawk population either moves away or gets hunted down or gets choked up by the CO2 from Palmetto Expressway and the hawks fly away somewhere else, then the pressure, the hawk pressure is off from the squirrel population and the squirrel population can become more feeble here, right? Because they no longer have the pressure of the hawks uh, flying overhead and, and hunting them down. So 
the, the squirrel population is also evolvable in that sense. Mm -hmm. And we see evolution happening, for example, legs or feet occurring uh, multiple times, all right? The emergence of, uh, of feet or legs has occurred in nature multiple times, just like the emergence of eyes. By the way, I just noticed this photo represents both, uh, but uh, I'm focusing on the feet. These are uh, shells, seashells, which are mollusks, all right? Mollusk is a phylum that is fairly distant from uh, the starfish, which are echinoderms, okay? Which also have feet, and these are tube feet. So uh, starfish and sea urchins, for example, they have dozens of feet compared to a single foot of a, uh, of a clam. And this is a praying mantis, which has uh, three pairs of feet, three pairs of legs, okay? Bilateral symmetry. And these uh, feet, these legs are articulated, whereas the tube feet are not articulated and the muscular foot uh, is not articulated either. So we have the emergence of feet many, many different times in nature because it is adapting to a particular function. Okay, and so that's why uh, <clears throat> legs, <coughs> different types of legs have emerged in nature over time to serve many, many different uh, animals, all right? Anything from simple legs like a muscular foot to very sophisticated leg pairs uh, as in the case of uh, arthropods or uh, insects, crustaceans like crabs, etc. I also mentioned eyes, for example, insects that have compound eyes and uh, echinoderms also have uh, simple eyes, eye spots, which are here at the tip of the legs and they are basically photosensitive cells that they detect light and darkness and very similar to these eyes are the eyes of mollusks that are lining up the, the shell here. You'll see this uh, in greater detail uh, in next class when we talk about adaptation. Okay, so eyes have also emerged many different times in nature independently of each other, independently. Okay, so the point is that where does selection act? Selection acts first on the phenotype of individual organisms. Variants then, less fit variants will get selected out. All right, the second object of selection or the second wave of selection, if you will, okay, is going to be in various other places, organic places. For example, the gametes. You understand that a gamete is not an organism as a whole, but it is a living cell from a particular species. So gametes also are subject to selection, for example, with regards to capacitation or potency. In fact, sperm actually end, uh, finishes its uh, capacitation inside the female reproductive tract. Okay. It's, it, it, it ends, it, uh, Continue, it um, brings its uh, capacitation to fullness only when it's inside the female reproductive tract. Uh, so uh, it's a very complicated mechanism that involves, again, uh, selection. So there is a group selection. Sometimes an entire group is uh, selected out. It could be by some biotic or some by abiotic factor. Typically, a climate, a drastic climate change may actually take out an entire group, not just individuals, but even the most fit individuals in a group. For example, if, if we cut down, you continue to cut down the forest, uh, either in the Amazon or the Congo Basin, we're going to select out entire groups of, of uh, species, you know, not just individuals within that species. So even the most fit uh, chimpanzee is going to die if we cut down its forest, okay? Uh, kin selection, uh, meaning that uh, sometimes siblings select against each other because again, they start competing for mates typically. 
And so they will, uh, or they could be competing for the same resources that are limited. Sibling cubs, uh, uh, lion cubs, may have to start competing with each other for the same prey when the prey becomes limited. There will be also interspecies uh, selection. For example, in, again, sticking with the tropical rainforest because it's so abundant, you have pumas and you have jaguars and you have uh, ocelots and you have uh, uh, what else down there? You have many different types of large cats. They're different species, but they're competing with each other because they're top carnivores, they're competing for the same prey. Okay, uh, so interspecies selection, this one uh, actually is going to point to uh, the competitive exclusion principle, right? And then there are CLAD selections. CLAD has to do with, um, with a group in a particular geographical region. And it's a large group. It includes various species, okay? And that, uh, so that a whole clad, a whole uh, group, a whole class of species may be wiped out because of some cataclysmic disaster that happens in nature. Uh, a cataclysm is a drastic and sudden, typically sudden uh, change in climate. Like for example, it's, uh, uh, it's believed that it happened with the dinosaurs when that meteorite hit uh, Mesoamerica there near the peninsula of Yucatan and, and uh, created a huge cloud of uh, dust and smoke that killed the plants. And the, when the plants died, then the herbivore dinosaurs died. And then the carnivore dinosaurs that were feeding on those herbivores also died. They ran out of food. Those were entire classes, huge swaths of plants and animals that were killed by a single cataclysmic event, okay? It's drastic, it's seldom, but it does happen. And we have evidence of at least uh, uh, five mass extinctions in the history of uh, the world in the, five, in the four billion years that we have of, uh, of uh, evidence of life on Earth. We also have evidence of at least five massive extinctions done by some kind of a cataclysmic event. So in general, why is evolution slow? Well, you think about it. Uh, at the end of the day, it has to do with more or less stable climate, more or less stable climate, not weather that changes all the time. And even climate does change, but climate changes over long periods of time. But on the short range, the weather is changing daily, seasonally, annually, but the climate is more or less the same, right? So last summer's temperature was more or less this summer's temperature and so on and so forth. So uh, if climate stays more or less stable, then species that are living today are the most successful species. So we're actually looking at the most successful species because the other species got selected out and we don't see them anymore, okay? And so the majority of the current species are the most successful ones. They're the ones that are best adapted and they have reached their carrying capacity. So unless there's rocks that change in the environment, typically in the climate, uh, but it could also be something like volcanoes or, or uh, other cataclysmic events, then the population species stays more or less the same. Even though there is a replacement that is going on, and we can say that every species is a, a, going toward extinction sooner or later, all right? Given drastic change, then we will see um, extinction. I have put here superbugs. Uh, superbugs, uh, you know about superbugs? They are these bacteria that are resistant to all of the, the range of, uh, of um, antibiotics that we have today. So, and these superbugs typically they live in uh, hospitals. That's why uh, 24 hours after open heart surgery, they're kicking you out the door, okay? Because they're afraid, they, the hospital is afraid that you'll get one of the superbugs that is lodged in their air conditioning system or something like that. And for which there is no antibiotic, okay? And so how did these superbugs come about? Not in nature, because in nature, they're just bugs, they're just bacteria that normally get killed by uh, antibiotics, okay? But remember, the bacteria colony is into the millions. By the time they're causing an infection, they're into the millions or trillions. 
So we take the antibiotic, and if it kills 99.99999% of those bacteria, okay, there's a one bacterium that survive. That means that that one bacterium is immune to that antibiotic. And in 20 minutes, that bacterium is going to split by binary fusion into two. And those two into two more, four, eight, 16, and now we're into a geometric progression. And within 24 hours, you have a million of that one bacterium that is now resistant to that antibiotic. <laughs> so the antibiotic is out the window for that one colony of bacteria, <laughs> okay? So we try a second antibiotic and it's gonna kill 99.9999% of that population but it's gonna leave one alive that is resistant now to antibiotic A and to antibiotic B and so on and so forth. And you play it forward and you get the superbugs that are immune to every antibiotic that we have. Very, very dangerous, okay? Because it takes a long time to develop these antibiotics, typically a year. <laughs> okay, so uh, superbugs are an example right in our phase of evolution, <laughs> adaptability, right? That antibiotic is selecting the weaker bacteria, but the stronger survive. And that's at the molecular level. All right. All this has to do with natural selection, which assumes random mating. Random mating, okay? Random mating. That's natural selection. Because if it doesn't assume random mating, then there's made choice. And that is not will, but at least instinct except for the human, all right? So uh, natural selection assumes random mating. But in fact, random mating, well, we can say random mating uh, among trees, that's fine. But in animals, typically it's not random mating, but it is sexual selection where there is a mate choice, okay? And so that changes the game because now when there is mate choice, uh, there is at least instinct involved. And in the case of human beyond instinct, hopefully there is also the will <laughs> involved. And that is sexual selection, which is non, -nat it is natural in a sense, but it's not the natural selection that is normally talked about, all right? So natural selection assumes random mating. When there is mate choice, then it's non-random mating, then that is sexual selection. And so there are two basic mechanisms for sexual selection, okay? Coming down to the end here, the two basic mechanisms are male competition to show vigor and female choice because the female has fixated on a particular trait of the male. So let's look at a few examples here. Uh, one, mm, very evident one is the size of the male versus the female. Typically, the male is bigger, and that happens uh, mostly on uh, mammals, but not necessarily. Here, for example, are uh, the male gorilla and the female gorilla, <laughs> okay? So that's what we call dimorphism, two shapes, dimorphism, all right? Where typically the male is larger than the female, that happens in mammals, generally, some mammals, but not all. Uh, in other animals, the female is larger, as in the case of many amphibians and fish also. But sometimes there is no dimorphism, okay? Where the male and the female look identical and we cannot tell them apart from the morph, from the shape. Hmm? I mentioned, uh, chimpanzees, for example. Uh, humans, we have very moderate dimorphism where the male is slightly larger or taller than the female. Okay? And it's called moderate uh, dimorphism. Um, this one is uh, more uh, drastic or exaggerated. Obviously, the female is selecting on uh, the male size but also males are competing against each other very aggressively so that they develop uh, a bigger body. It is generally sophisticated, the whole issue of, um, of uh, morphism is very sophisticated and it happens really at all four levels that we talked about, the morphological, the physiological, the behavioral, and the biochemical. 
or molecular. For example, these are uh, beta splendens. These are the Siamese fighting fish, okay? But the male, this is definitely the male, all right? The female, it's uh, smaller, it doesn't have the fancy fins, and it's more drab in color, more of a drab color like this, but it doesn't have the fancy fins, all right? And you can see that the female is uh, kind of fixated on the fins uh, and the display of the male, because this is the aggressive display to the point that they even flare out their, their gills, the male does, flares out the gills, okay? And they can also do that when they're put in front of a mirror because they're male to male competition and they think it's another male on the other side of the mirror. <laughs> so, here we see two male elk uh, competing with each other and these two in the back are probably females. One looks like she's interested, the other one looks like she's not interested, but these two males are involved in that competition, which again can happen at the four levels. Mm. On the part of humans, it gets much more complicated because uh, the selection is on both sides, uh, male competition and female selection, okay? So this is a photo from the disco era, you remember? Staying alive, staying alive, okay, that was my time when I was young. <laughs> and uh, so it's extremely sophisticated, as you can see, for the human, but it's still there, okay? And we're not immune to instinct. Uh, so hopefully the will will kick in above and beyond the instinct so that the selection is done consciously and for good reason, but uh, we're not immune to selection of male competition and Hello. male choice. Hmm? Huh. Finally, uh, the thing can go um, kind of berserk and into what is known as runaway selection. Okay, runaway selection, stampede selection. <laughs> when the female essentially fixates on a particular trait of the male and stays, this is down to the genetic level because we see that on average, any normal pea hen, which is the female of the peacock, is fixated on the tail of the male, of the peacock, all right? And it's not only fixated on the tail, the number of eyes that are displayed on that tail, but actually the actual display of the tail. So the male has to raise its tail and flare it and wiggle it, you know, in, in a fashion to attract the female. And so that is extremely expensive for the male, energetically speaking, to do all that, all right? And it's extreme exposure also because if a Bengal tiger happens to be around, it's very easy to spot this, <laughs> okay? And it's, and it's cumbersome for this poor peacock to fly away from the tiger. So the most vigorous peacock may actually be taken down by the tiger if the tiger happens to be nearby, <laughs> all right? And the, the one who lost out is a pea head because she didn't get to mate <laughs> and didn't get the vigorous uh, uh, genes from that male. But this is called runaway selection. It doesn't happen in all species, but it happens um, quite often and typically these are what makes fancy or exotic animals in wildlife, okay? It happens at every level in animals. It happens a lot in insects also, and um, these are coleoptera, these are uh, beetles. You can see that the female is fixed on the horn of the male here, okay? And it's just a fancy display. Mm, it may or may not have a function. Uh, the, the male may actually use it for male-to-male -male competition, similar to the antlers. Uh, where was the antlers? Yeah, okay. So the more points the antler has, uh, the better on the fight. Typically the fights are not to death, they're just display of strength, okay? There's strength this way until finally it is established who's the alpha male and who's the beta male here, okay? But uh, that uh, runaway selection does happen in some species. It's part of uh, sexual selection, 
and it leads to eventually exotic species where there is an extreme dimorphism between the male and the, the female. Okay, folks, that's all I have. You've been patient, patiently enduring this today. But this is on uh, just kind of scratching the surface on selection. But we see that it is there in nature. It's kind of latent, acting all the time, continuously putting its pressure on fitness, on fitness, okay? So the counterbalance to this is what we call adaptability or what Meyer is calling adaptedness, which is what we're going to see uh, next lecture, okay? The lecture on adaptedness. Uh, so the response of organisms to the selective pressure of the environment, whether it's natural selection or uh, sexual selection. Questions, comments, anything? Oh yes, okay, so I just listed them there. Yes, Meyer goes into detail there of the reasons why um, natural selection and sexual selection are limited. I really don't have time to cover it, but it's a little too much detail, too much biological detail for the purpose of this first half of the course. Remember that the first half of the course, I'm basically presenting you evidence for the possibility of evolution, okay? And the fact that we as humans are not excluded from that possibility. And so evolution also impinges uh, the human species, right? But uh, that's a little bit too much detail, but since it was in chapter six, I just listed it there. You don't need to uh, give me any more detail other than this. Other than to note that really at the end of the day, uh, all species are, um, are geared toward extinction sooner or later, all right? And the vast majority of species that have existed on Earth to this day have indeed become extinct. It's not necessarily a bad thing because when one species becomes extinct, typically a niche opens, a new habitat opens for another species to take in that, that role and to expand with variants to eventually lead to more speciation, okay? So we go from these extinctions to uh, adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiation, and we'll look at that uh, next class. Okay, thanks again, and uh, God willing, we'll meet up uh, next Saturday. Thanks. Thanks.